God's people said? Amen. Amen. On Wednesday evenings during the school year, we have a great choir program from ages preschool through junior high. And tonight, the primary and the junior choirs are going to present for you the musical Kids World. understand igneous is a kind of rock in fact it's one of the oldest rocks around well if you're so old and so smart maybe you know how we got here in the first place well let's see first it was very very dark and god said God is going to make you into something very special. Just look at me. I started out as hot lava from a volcano. I rolled down the mountain and picked up all these sparkling crystals. See here? Oh, yeah. You see? 
God divided the land from the water. That's when he made the volcano I came from.
Miss Pilly, what do you think is the most important thing God made? You mean next to woolly worms and rocks? Yeah, uh, even more important than that, he made man. And why was he so important? Because he made man in the very image of God himself. He must have had to use some very special gritty ingredients to make a man. Not actually. In <coughs> fact, God made man out of dust. Oh, don't even say that word. It makes me have to, to sneeze just thinking about a, a, a chew. God called the first man Adam and gave him a very important, important job of naming all the animals. So Adam is the one who called me a worm in the first place. <laughs> Well, Miss Pilly, I think it's time to tell you, you're not a worm, you're a caterpillar, and there's a big difference. You see, God gave caterpillars a very special job to do. A special job? What is it? I'll do whatever he says. Well, first you're supposed to spin a cocoon, but maybe I better not tell you why. Just do it because God told you to, and you'll find out the reason later. A cocoon, huh? Okay, I'll give it a try. I'm sure if God really wants me to, he'll show me how. story to tell you. It's about Adam and his new friend. Some other time, okay? Right now I need my beauty sleep. Good night. It's really a very romantic story, you know, about how they fall in love.
Is that really you? Yes, don't I look beautiful? Yes, Miss Papilio, you certainly do. Did you say Miss Papilio? Yes, it means butterfly. Then you knew it all along, didn't you? God really did have a special plan for me. Just think, if I hadn't done what you had told me, I'd still be a creepy old woolly worm. And now, I can fly. And you know what, kids? God has a very special plan for you, too. All you have to do is give yourself to him, and he'll make you into whatever he wants you to be. And how do we do that? Well, first you spin a nice brown cocoon. No, no. And then you take a long nap. And when you wake up, you'll be a beautiful butterfly. No, no. Oh, brother, you got it all mixed up. Kids don't turn into butterflies. Then what do they turn into? They turn into God's children. Oh, I get it. God's kids, right? It, and God made the world for his own kids. It really is a kid's world. What a friend we have in Jesus. Hymn number 123. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a 
privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not care.
follow and act like that. I'm certainly at this age not going to turn into a butterfly. <laughs> and I can't even catch bubbles in a ball glove, so I don't know what in the world I'm going to do. All right, if you have your Bibles, get Leviticus 10 in one hand and Isaiah 6 in the other. Leviticus 10 in one hand, Isaiah 6 in the other. If I were to entitle this tonight, I would be really pulled between two different titles. One is Holy Fire holy fire and someone suggested to me one time that you should call it hell is a holy place hell is a holy place let us direct our attention this evening to one of the most profound subjects in all of scripture and that is the holiness of God holiness may be defined as the total absence of sin the absolute propriety of action the apex of purity the absolute dichotomy of good and evil. Theologians tell us that holiness is God's central attribute. That is, it is the attribute from which the others emanate and are controlled. We know that God can't lie, but he can't lie because he's holy. God can't cheat. He can't cheat because he's holy. God can't be vindictive. God can't be improperly motivated. God can't be unfair. All of these things because he is absolutely holy. Holiness, its glorification and declaration seems to be the primary activity of the angels. Uh, quickly, get Isaiah 6 and take a look at the first four verses. And the book says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. As they say, where there's smoke, there's fire. Holiness often has as its physical manifestation, fire. Describing our holy God, the writer of Hebrews says, quote, our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. This is also repeated word for word in Deuteronomy 4, 24. Notice that it is not a comparative simile that is used here. He's not saying our God is likened unto or like a fire. He is saying here, he is a literal consuming fire. The Lord our God is an absolutely holy God. Now for the next few minutes tonight, let's consider four things concerning the physical manifestation of God's fiery holiness. And be aware that we're treading on holy ground, unfathomable ground tonight. We should spiritually take off our shoes from off our feet. We are far too lax in this era in our handling of God. He's not the man upstairs. He's not Father Time. He's not, as Jane Russell called him, the cutest thing. He's not the main man. He is very God of very God. The Jews wouldn't even utter his name. And we better be careful how we utter it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, for the next few minutes, we just ask as we consider thy very essence that thou help us to rightly divide thy word and then Lord help us to remember that thou art as the old Puritans used to put it an awful God and they meant that in a good sense thou art a God to be dealt with to be reckoned with to be considered in everything that we do and Lord we want to please you tonight help us to rightly divide this word and help it to find lodging place in the hearts of hearers for we ask it in Christ's wonderful and precious name and for his sake amen four things and the first thing that we'd like to consider tonight is the fact that the holy fire of God is unique turn if you will to Leviticus 10 I'm not going to take time to read this but if you will quickly peruse it as I am telling the story and see that I do no violation to the facts in the text I think it'll help us a great deal 
1490 B.C., the religious section of the Wilderness Gazette might have carried this article. Two young preacher's sons, Nadab and Abihu, of the house of Aaron, have recently graduated cum laude from Jericho Seminary and are returning to the Wilderness Baptist Tabernacle to assist their father as his associates. Now, when these two theological neophytes arrived and began their duties, one of the first things they were confronted with was an, uh, an instrument inside the tabernacle called the brazen altar. The brazen altar was constructed to divine specifications, was for the purpose of consuming the sin offerings of the children of Israel, and this thing was personally ignited by the essence of God's fiery holiness as he descended from heaven for that express purpose, according to Leviticus 9. In other words, the sins of the people were to be expiated by God's fire, and not just God's fire, but literally God on fire as he came down to deal with the sin question. Now let me construct a hypothetical conversation that fits Leviticus 10. The Reverend Mr. Nadab, B-A-B-D-D-D, -D -D, said to the Reverend Dr. Abihu, B-A-M-A-T-H-M-P-H-D, what in the world is this silly looking contraption just inside the door of the tabernacle here? Well, Reverend, this is where the sin offering takes place. This is where the rabble perceive in some kind of a superstitious rite that the blood of the animal slain here somehow covers their faults. <laughs> Rather gory, don't you think? Ooh, it is, Doctor. Tell me, Doctor, do you really believe that blood and sin stuff? Well, now, Reverend, this is just a primitive example of religious superstition that we'll have to move slowly in changing. You remember that lecture by Dr. Oxnum up at the seminary when he stated that any God who would punish sin is a dirty bully? Do you remember the reference he made to a slaughterhouse religion? Well, this is what he was talking about, blood being spilled and messed around for sin. Ah, I remember well, Doctor. That sin and fiery judgment stuff may be all right for Father Aaron and Uncle Moses, but after all, they haven't had the educational opportunities that we've had, have they? Now, Reverend, we're going to have to channel them into a more modern religious position. If we don't, we'll start losing members to that new Baal Universal Church up the Strip. And we'll start our new program this, Sab this Sabbath with some newfangled fire on this altar. We're not going to depend on the old stuff. We're going to come up with some new stuff. Now, in Leviticus 10... The Bible reveals that they prepared their own fire on their own censers for the coming service. They mixed in a little fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. They mixed in a new, few new versions of the Hebrew scriptures that were closer to the original Hebrew. They mixed in a little ecumenism. Uh, they put on a tongue's coal or two, you know, to satisfy the holiness crowd. They erased negativism and inserted positivism. They scratched out holiness and they wrote in love. They rubbed out the resurrection and made it symbolic. They removed capitalism and replaced it with socialism. They removed competition and replaced it with cooperation. They de-emphasized the individual and re-emphasized the group. They wiped out blood and they put on a coal or two of works. They got this whole ungodly concoction of strange fire together, and they approached the brazen altar of God's holy fire, bent on integrating their new substance with God's old substance. They didn't know what would happen. Everyone was very excited, and they got the surprise of their lives because when they got there and dumped their new coals on God's old coals, there was a tremendous explosion, a flash of light, and Nadab and Abihu were never seen again. Sadly, men today still attempt to deal with sin by bringing strange fire. Some bring the strange fire of good works, or the golden rule, or many ways, or sincerity, or baptism, or form and repetition. Some bring the strange fire of church membership. Some, sadly, bring the strange fire of mama's or granddad's religion. Now, the reaction may not be as immediate, but the result will ultimately be the same. Utter destruction by fire. How should you settle the sin question? We'll have a little more to say on that later. But note that point number one is the fire of God is unique, and you better not mess around with it and mix it with anything else. Secondly, 
The holy fire of God is literal and eternal. While I was a student at Bob Jones University, I was privileged to travel about three of those years with an evangelistic judo team that toured the southeastern states. Our ministry was primarily to young people and ballooned in the two and a half years or so I was with the team to quite a large scale ministry. It started small, but the last semester I was there, we performed for 25 to 30,000 kids, saw, not all of them really kids, and saw something around 1,000 decisions for Jesus Christ. But contacting young people in street rallies, boys clubs, churches, colleges, army camps, high school assemblies, and even in state prisons, I found that the question most often directed to the team, and even to me individually, was this, is hell a literal place? used to be probably 90% of our population felt that hell was a literal place. Now we're getting even a lot of good, godly, so-called Christians beginning to doubt, could there be such an awful place as hell? But it still bothers them. The possibility still bothers them enough to ask the question, is hell a literal place? Some of the more initiated, specifically an inmate at the maximum security prison in Montgomery, Alabama, even use the scientific argument that there is not enough combustible material enough in the universe to generate or supply an eternal fire. That is, what he was saying was, that which is perishable cannot be eternal. And I don't care how big the universe is, it can eventually be burned out, can it? If you're going to use it as the substance that burns, he's right. But the fellow erred in not recognizing that our eternal, immutable, indestructible God is an eternal fire. Amen. He's not going to use other means to burn up hell. He's going to use himself. And he will never, never perish. Amen. When our fiery God comes into contact with something temporal, it either commends that thing it comes into contact with or it condemns that thing it comes into contact with. When God comes into contact with something, it either results in purging or in perishing. For instance, the children of Israel in the Old Testament, after they came out of the land, we discussed that this morning, uh, they were encamped there by Mount Sinai for about a year while the law was being given, and the rule was, stay away from the mountain. Stay away from the mountain. Stay away from the mountain. You go too close to the mountain, you touch the mountain, you die. You die. Why was that? Because the sin offerings were being given at that time. They were not in vogue yet, in force yet. And if you approached that mountain and you didn't do it in the right way and you contacted God, there would be condemnation at that point and you'd die. Amen. Sodom and Gomorrah, the wicked cities of the plain, they were approached by a theophany. God appearing on earth, Jesus Christ appearing as an angel. And when he went into that place, something happened. He came out and there was an explosion and Sodom and Gomorrah perished. Nadab and Abihu, they contacted God in the brazen altar. There was an explosion and they died in that place. However, Elijah on Mount Carmel. You remember Elijah called down fire from heaven and there was not an explosion. There was commendation at that point. Why? At Pentecost in the New, New Testament, cloven tongues as of fire fell on the supplicants there. There was not condemnation, but commendation at that point. Why? Someone says, yeah, but what about hell? I'm coming to that. Isaiah 30, 33 says, quote, For a tophet, literally a place of fire, a tophet is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large, the pile thereof is fire and much wood. Listen now, the breath of the Lord like a stream of brimstone doth kindle it. God Almighty, the literal fire. As incongruous as it might sound to the mind of the natural man, hell is an expression of the holiness of God. In our definition of holiness, we found that it was basically separation with the modus operandi of the separation being fire, fire separating good and evil, right and wrong, righteousness and unrighteousness, God and the devil, and ultimately the saint and the sinner. Liberals wail, what are you talking about? Are you insane? A holy God couldn't do that. Nonsense. A holy God would be violating his very holiness if he did anything else. His holiness demands separation of good and evil. And the only effective way to do it is by fire. Not combustible material enough, 
God himself is the material, the fuel, and the combustion, and hell will never be extinguished until the kindling breath of our God, the consuming fire, is consumed in death, and that will be never. Amen. The classic writer Homer, in one of his writings, pictured the white throne judgment, and he pictured an old sinner who had never accepted Jesus Christ approaching that white throne. And he portrayed that thing as the righteous judge of the universe said, You have not accepted my son, therefore you are banished forever to flames in the pit. And that old sinner had the reaction we would all have, I think. You know, you can take almost anything if there's an end to it. I don't care whether it's pain, I don't care whether it's deprivation, I don't care whether it's runaway inflation or an economy that looks like it's... Uh, just gone you know you don't have a job you can take anything if someone will just tell you it's for a few days or a few weeks or a few months or for a few years but one of these days it'll be over but not so in this case and Homer pictured that sinner leaving the king and going and suddenly his face blanches as he sees those flames in that pit into which he is about to be cast and he turns around to the judge and he says but how long O Lord how long how long and the Lord says, wail on, lost soul, wail on, wail on. And he gets a few steps closer until finally he's looking over into the pit itself and he can see it in all of its horror. And he turns and one more time just pitiably cries, but how long, O oh Lord? How long? How long? How long? And the words come back from the judge, wail on, lost soul, wail on, wail on, wail on. But how long, O oh Lord? How long? How long? And that judge says, till the sun grows cold and the moon grows old, till the leaves of the judgment book unfold, till God himself lies withered and cold. Wail on, lost soul. Wail on, wail on, wail on. How long? And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20.10. Okay, the fire of God is unique. The fire of God is literal and eternal. The Lord our God is an absolutely holy God, and that holiness is manifested in that our God is a literal consuming fire. What have we found so far? The fire is unique. The fire is literal and eternal. And thirdly, the holy fire of God is modified by only one substance in the universe. Let me explain. We've already seen that when the holiness of God contacts a non-eternal substance, it either commends or condemns. We have seen that whether it causes purging or perishing, it's the same God, not a different one. It's the same holiness, not another attribute taking over. Someone says God is love, but if he exercised love at the expense of segregating good and evil, it would reduce him to something less than God. Love and punishment, even though the natural man can't discern this, love and punishment are not incompatible. The thing that is incompatible is love and no punishment. If you love your child, you'll do what to him? You'll punish him. If you don't love him and you're selfish and you worry more about what he thinks of you than what he's going to become, then you won't punish him. If you love him, you'll beat the daylights out of him when he needs it. And you're not unholy when you do that. All right. What is the determining factor? What is the modifying agent? What causes commendation in some instances and condemnation in others? And the answer biblically is this. It is the protective shield or lack of it of sacrificial blood. The protective shield or lack of it of sacrificial blood. In the case of Mount Sinai, the system was being set up as we explained. There was no systematic blood sacrifice at the time. Therefore, the person that approached the mountain wasn't covered with blood. He touched the mountain. He died. In the case of Solomon and Gomorrah, there was no shield of blood erected. So when the angel went in there, the theophany, the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and he contacted the place, there was an explosion. In the case of Nadab and Abihu, their newfangled fire they dumped on the altar had not been bathed in a blood sacrifice. They didn't believe in the blood. They were good liberals. They died. Nadab and Abihu are no more. Ah, but in the case of Elijah, there had been a burnt offering. There had been blood spilled. There was the erection of a shield. Therefore, when the fire of God fell, there was commendation. 
and in the case of the 120 in the upper room, the newly riven side of the Lord Jesus Christ had flowed with blood. The last sacrifice that ever had to be made had been made there. And those supplicants had accepted that Lord and appropriated that blood. Thus, when the cloven tongues as a fire fell, there was commendation for those in that room. Turn your Bibles back to that tremendous passage we read at the outset, Isaiah 6. We'll read the verses again and add a few to them. And in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. The glorious 52-year reign of Uzziah is over. It is a time of transition, of uncertainty, and of self-examination for any spiritually-minded Hebrew. It's the same for any American today. It was the hour of the evening sacrifice. The prophet was standing in the temple in eastern Jerusalem where some of you have stood if you've taken Holy Land tours. And there he received a vision of the utter holiness of God that underscored his own wretched condition as nothing before had ever done and would forever change his life. Once he had seen God, seen him in all of his true essence, nothing as academic as missing the mark would describe how he felt. He was sick and miserable and broken and despairing of life. At that point, a celestial being called a seraph plucked a coal off the altar and wiped it across the speechless lips of our contrite prophet. What altar? The same altar that had been violated by Nadab and Abihu, the brazen altar, the sin altar. That, ma that altar was built in the same manner of a modern barbecue. There was a grate across the top. A lamb was laid on that thing, and the lamb was not bled yet. The throat was slit, the thing was burned, and blood dripped out from that lamb and bathed every coal under that grate on the altar. The drippings of the blood of these recently sacrificed animals had bathed every coal, and consequently when that blood-bathed coal was picked up by that seraph and it was wiped across the lips of the speechless prophet, he was purged, washed, cleansed, justified, redeemed, converted, and all the other euphemisms that we use for salvation. Without the transforming agent of the blood bathing the coal, he would have been as Nadab and Abihu, utterly consumed. The blood and the blood alone could have diverted the explosive wrath of God's condemnation. And folks, it's exactly the same way today. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Throughout this message, we have said that God is absolutely holy. Perhaps it would have been more accurate to say that God is holiness absolute. In the realm of physics, there is what is known as zero absolute. That is, on our thermometers, there's a notation that reads zero. And when it gets down to that point, it would be correct to say that it is absolutely zero, but it would be incorrect to say that it is zero absolute. Zero absolute is 459.7 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. In the physical realm, there are two elements warring for supremacy in our nature, heat and cold. Our thermometer records which one of them is relatively winning or losing this battle. Zero absolute is the point at which cold has won a complete victory. The total absence of heat, pure, unadulterated, uncontest, unmixed, uncompromising cold at that point. Friend, in the presence of God, there can only exist holiness absolute. 
the complete victory of right, the total absence of sin, and for you to live eternally up in an abode with Jesus Christ and God his Father, you must somehow become pure, unadulterated, uncontested, unmixed, uncompromising righteousness, or you can't go. Listen, everyone here is going to one day be confronted by Almighty God. You're going to be confronted by the fiery essence of Almighty God. For you to live eternally with God, somehow you've got to survive that confrontation. When he reaches out and touches you, will there be an explosion? Or will there be commendation? For there to be commendation, you must be bathed in the sacrificial blood of the Lamb of God, slain for sin, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you been? When you look into the blazing eyes of God, the God of this universe, who is holiness absolute, what will it be? Commendation? Condemnation. Literal hell forever and ever and ever and ever, as long as the God of the universe exists? Or commendation? Will he say, enter my son? into the court of heaven prepared for those that have accepted my son. Which will it be? You're going to meet him. That's sure. You may cheat death, but you're going to meet him. He's going to touch you. That's sure. He'll touch every man. What will it be for you? Only you can answer that. But if you have never accepted him, we're going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. Our Heavenly Father, this is just an awesome subject. It's the most startling thing that a man consider, can consider when he considers thy very holiness and his own wretched sinful condition and what he can do about it to somehow attain eternal felicity. And Father, we know the plan. We know that each man individually for himself must somehow appropriate and bathe himself by faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, if there are those here this evening that have not done it or not sure they've done it, they don't know for sure that they're going to one day spend an enjoyable eternity with thee, we pray that they would not leave the auditorium in their present condition, but would somehow make a provision for that meeting. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Every head remained bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. We wouldn't want to embarrass anyone. Now, folks, we've discussed tonight something called positional holiness, theologically. Positional holiness. Now, as long as you're down here on earth, you're not holy. We know that. Uh, you're not perfect. You're going to sin of necessity nearly every day of your life. Even if you're saved, you're going to do that. We're not talking about personal holiness. We're talking about positional holiness. And you are positionally holy if you are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ because as God looks down and sees you, he doesn't see you.